Hello and welcome to our show, Film Talk with AJ Dean. I'm AJ Dean, your host, and I have the amazing celebrity game show superstar extraordinaire, Paul Vato here with me. Hello, Paul. <laughs> hey, AJ. Thank you so much for having me. So I guess by now people have seen my appearance on To Tell the Truth. So thank you. Thank you for that uh, amazing intro. And uh, I, I hope that maybe to be just known as maybe a superstar uh, without the game show, but I think it's a good start. So thank you for having me and, uh, and, and being a part of this. Thank you, AJ. So happy you are here. Thank you, Paul. And we have an amazing and phenomenal guest. I'm so honored and thrilled. We have Rich Hopkins. Let's give him a warm welcome. He is a stunt coordinator and stuntman from Las Vegas. And he's been in the business over like 25 years or something, maybe even a little longer. Hello, Rich. How are you? Hi there, AJ. Hi, Paul. How are you guys doing? We're Hi, doing Rich. Wonderful. Thank you for being here. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. We're doing great, and we're going to get right into it. We're so excited, Rich. Um, you have been, and I just want to tell a little bit, um, the audience, about your uh, films. You've been in feature films, TV shows, commercials, video games. You've hosted live shows, and you have also, this is incredible. I have to read this. Jumped off buildings. Uh, you have um, been on fire. Spider-Man. Um, Spider-Man walking up a building or down a building. You've done the Virgin bus commercial and you've hung from helicopters. Is that right? Or please, please correct me. No, that, that was a pretty good overview. I, okay. I mean, uh, yeah. What haven't you done, Rich? <laughs> actually, I haven't base jumped. When, when base jumping became popular, I was actually really heavily into paragliding in like the early 90s. And then base jumping came out where, you know, guys are just jumping off of buildings and bridges and cliffs. And I was married at the time. So uh, I was told no. So. Okay. That's that, understandable. You know, I'm, a little, I'm a little too old and had a couple back surgeries. So base jumping did not make it in this lifetime for me. Yes. I, I'm glad that safety comes first with you. I can tell that already about you. And, and we love that about you. So I want to jump right into it and mention these great movie posters that we have on screen. Smiley Face Killers in 2020 and Sushi Girl in 202012. Rich, could you talk to us a little bit about those movies, what you did, some of the stunts, a little bit more information to share with the audience? Well, um, I, I guess those two stand out for me just because they were fun to do. And I got to work with, you know, friends and, and people that then became friends. Sushi Girl goes back a decade or so, but I mean, it had such a great cast. It was, you know, Mark Hamill, Tony Todd, Michael Bean, Danny Trejo, Noah Hathaway, my friend Andy McKenzie. And it was just a wild bloodbath. So there was, I think we had about two or three dozen weapons, two or 300 rounds of, of blank ammo and squib packs going off and just everyone ends up dead, so. Amazing, now did you use Hershey's chocolate on it, on it at all? No, <laughs> what would that be for? Well, I only mentioned that because we had John Blythe Barrymore of the Barrymore family on our show previously and he said okay. he was in uh, uh, um, a, you know, uh, a horror film, and he couldn't get the taste of Ch Hershey's chocolate out of his mouth. So do they use that still at all? Well, I mean, there's different types of blood compounds that are edible. Like the blood, the blood packs we were using were electronically fired pyrotechnic squibs. They weren't like the air compressor jobbies that, that new filmmakers use. These were the real deal pyro packs. Um, wow. There was just standard blood that we would put in a cup, pour it in the guy's mouth uh, that was being tortured. So you got to go, you got to watch the movie though. I can't, I can't have the spoiler alert going or whatever. Of course, called. of course, we understand. Over to you, Paul. Did you want to mention something? No, oh no, that's that, that that's fantastic. It's uh, I, I like that. There's this difference between maybe the old school and then and maybe the the new school, like like you said, air packs versus the the, the older squibs. Is there, I mean, is there a, not a rivalry, but is there like, oh, these young kids, they don't have it the way <laughs> we used to. We actually had to use these pyro packs. 
or is or is that just I mean the evolution of the industry where where maybe it's safer? I I don't know. Is is that or is that? And then I do have something else to mention. Uh, okay. So so if we could. Well, I, I can explain the, the. I'll explain the differences. First of all, it's a budgetary thing. Okay, to do professional stunts costs money. Okay, so that's first and foremost for all the producers, up and coming producers. I always recommend don't do stunts if you can't afford to do them and do them right. Um, that's one of the problems out here in Vegas. I think during the COVID, we had a, a handful of people wake up one day and say, "Hey, I'm a stunt coordinator," and I'm like well, how do you set up a car to flip it? You know, what are the three ways to rig a span set? I mean, just general things that stunt coordinators know and those those couldn't be answered. So back to the squib thing, professional squibs are done and shot with a like a quarter grain uh, pyro packet that goes on the back of a blood pack, which is also sits in a metal cup. Okay, it's attached to the actor's body or the stunt person's body. And there's neoprene or leather between the actual charge and them. So those are fired by a pyrotechnician that has to be licensed by the ATF, okay, alcohol, tobacco, firearms. Any state jurisdictions, like here in Nevada, you need to have a Nevada powders card, powder card to be able to fire that off. And then there's also local permitting, licensing, and insurance. So the difference is if you're doing a normal feature film or a commercial or whatever that takes stunts, you're going to hire a pyrotechnician to come in and rig those. So if you're doing lower end films in this net, it's way more cost effective to use rubber tubing and air compressors. Those are not reliable and they're messy because if you misfire um, early, late, or, or there's just a general misfire because it goes off, then you got to reset you know, you're talking about having two or three sets of wardrobe and all that. Wow. wow. So, yeah, so lower in productions can try to get away with the air compressor deal, but that's not really how it's done in my world. Wonderful, yeah, the, great, great answer. Because as an actor, I like to know, I guess maybe as a business owner, I like to know every aspect of the industry, whether I'm able to do it uh, or, or not, I still I still at least want to learn. I feel a lot of people are like that or at least should be like that because mm -hmm. now I know what you have to go through. So I'm not sitting there going like, well, why do they got to do this? Why do they got to put this on me? Why do they got, it's like mm -hmm. now now we know. So thank thank you for sharing that. And and I see that it is, you know, like I said, it's budgetary if, if you know, but then again, if you do it the, the less expensive way, it might end up costing you more because now it's more time. If if it goes off prematurely, now okay, well, okay, back to one. Re, you know, redress this person. So so I I can I can I see ask that. you this. This is a real pressing question for me. I want to know the answer, and I think our audience will be interested too. What keeps the body in shape doing these stunts? And could you also tell us about as you get older, what do you have to do to keep uh, being able to do these incredibly physical stunts? Well, um, being that I'm 58 years old and I've been doing stunt work for 34 years. So you did miss it by a few years, by the way. Um, I've been, I, I've been put through the ringer physically. So like my, my things I do right now, act, active wise, I play a ton of disc golf, Frisbee golf, tennis, I haven't been in the gym since the whole COVID thing because I figured if you were going to get it anywhere, it would be in a gym, which is a big Petri dish, you know, yeah. for germs. Um, I'm getting ready to go back because I like to go in once or twice a week. You know, I'm not a gym rat. I don't, it's not really my thing, but, you know, two or three times a week just to get a little, little pump going is, is fine. But um, yeah, I mean, with my broken bone count, if I didn't stay active, I would, be jello. Oh, do you eat like green drinks or um, salads or high protein? What's your diet on that How, for a you stunt man? I believe in the basic food groups. You know, I mean, I'm not real extreme on either end of the spectrum. Um, I, I just try to eat a balanced diet, you know, but like everyone else, I could probably use five or 10 pounds 
to be shredded, you know, but I mean, I'm in for, again, for all my injuries and surgeries and my age, I think I'm in pretty good shape, but yes. I, you know, I mean, if I ever need a, a ego boost, I just kind of go into Walmart and I look pretty good. <laughs> how dare you sir um have you, you look how great many <laughs> thank you but, but, but yeah wishing out you're gonna look amazing how, uh how many bones have you broken you know what i it sounds weird but i kind of lost count it used to be like uh, you know i've broken 34 bones but i mean you're talking about uh, i used to be big into like ex, uh you know aggressive inline skating i guess they called it going off the of handrails and loading docks and all that. So I've blown out both my ankles, you know, pretty much broken every toe and finger at least twice. So my hands are all crooked and, you know, weird. Um, I've broken my neck. I've broken my back twice. I've had open heart surgery, no spleen, no gallbladder and no appendix. I've broke, uh, cracked probably three ribs and had I think two or three concussions. So that's, I don't, that's, that's a lot, Rich, that you've been through. And um, it's amazing how you, do you have any pain now through all of that? Or do you just, like you said, keep moving and that's what keeps you in good shape? Well, yeah, I mean, staying active definitely helps. Um, pain is something that you, it's kind of a chronic thing. You just learn to live with it and staying active is pretty much the only thing keeping me going. But um, back in the day when I started in the business and I was meeting some of the old timers, I mean, they would go out and get beat up and flip a car or whatever. And they'd swallow a handful of, you know, painkillers and chase it with some Jack Daniels was kind of like the old school. Um, that's not really my thing. I, I'm, I've never been a big, you know, pain pill guy. Uh, Cause OP, it makes me itch and stuff. But the, one of the good things, if, if I may, my friend has a CBD company called iLife. Now this looks like speed stick, which it kind of is. It's a CBD bomb. Okay. So if anything hurts my back or whatever, I just kind of, you know, put that on. And then there's also the supplemental dailies and the gummies. Right? Are you getting all that? Yes, like wonderful. Shameless plug. Shameless plug. <laughs> we love no, it. That's all right. Right. So, so that helps. That helps. But really just staying active and, and trying to keep the weight down and, and being active. What other sponsors do you have or we, would you like to share, Rich? <laughs> Want to go here? We'll get those away. Well, Ironclad is my glove sponsor, and they just happened to send a new shipment in. So I got these some groovy new. You know, these are heavy duty gloves. These are tactical gloves for shooting, right? And then you got working gloves. These you can actually even, they're touch screen gloves. So you don't have to take them off to grab a call or whatever. And then safety gloves that are nice and loud. So Ironclad, they've been taking care of me for years and I love them. And they're the best gloves on, on the planet. Oh, thank, thank you. you for, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that because we love... We love great companies like that. And can you say them one more time and where people can, can yeah. get them? We have iLife Wellness. Okay. We'll look them up. And then we have Ironclad, which is right here. Okay. Ironclad.com. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Rich. We appreciate you and them. And I wanted to also ask you, what was your favorite moment so far in your career, Rich? What has been your favorite moment as a Hollywood stuntman and actor? Well, uh, depends on whether it would be considered a live show or a commercial or music video or film. I, probably the, the biggest stunt I ever did was the Spider-Man uh, stunt for the dvd release i think it was 2003 on halloween day blockbuster remember the video store you used to go and rent videos yeah. the young people may not but blockbuster <laughs> entertainment along with whoever the film company was hired me to put on the spidey suit and go off the tower in dallas wow i think it's that right is here. So cool. That was one of the pictures that I saw on, um, on your IMDb. And amazing because you are up 
high on a building. I mean, you, you, what did you have as the safety net there? Did you just have a rope or what, what was it, Rich? With that, I, I, first of all, I had a world-class rigging team. Um, my friend Lane Levitt and then Kevin Scott, Jeff Pruitt, William Devital. Um, we planned this out for like two weeks and Lane Levitt and I flew into Dallas and checked out the building with the engineers and all that, figured out what we could rig to. And I had to have an, a custom made rope made for that. It was a, a thousand foot. I actually ordered 1200 feet because the building was like 998 feet, but you always want some slack, of course. So I had to have this big spool delivered and then we had to get everything to, to the roof. Um, so it was pretty gnarly. It was an 11 mil rope. So I don't know if you, you know, it was basically about this big around size of a pin. Of a wow. Pin. And originally we were going to have me attached at two points. So, but the problem was that I couldn't move laterally because, you know, if you move this way, you got to pull this slack up on this one and let slack down on that one. So it was stupid. So we decided just to have me on one line, which means there's no backup. And the worst part about that, <laughs> to be honest, it was Halloween day. So the school district knew all about this stunt that was going on. Oh, Spider-Man coming down the building for the DVD release. They bust in all these kids, like little third grader, fourth grade little kids to watch Spidey go down the building. So, man, <laughs> talking about doing some soul searching, I was, I was like, please, if any, don't let anything go wrong. I would not want those poor kids to be traumatized watching Spidey plummet to his death, you know. Oh, yeah. You had to make sure everything was safe, right? Kind of a one and done situation. Yeah. Yeah. I. I had to trust in the crew that I brought in and, and, you know, they're all again, world-class stunt coordinators, riggers and stuntmen themselves. So thank goodness you were as, working with the best. <laughs> well, you're only as good as, as the people you surround yourself with. So even as now I'm primarily a stunt coordinator, even though I still like to get down on fire burns and car crashes, but I spend a lot of time working with the director and setting up the action, you know, Amazing, amazing. Yeah, I saw some of those pictures um, of you on set and behind the scenes, uh, even working with Richard Branson, right? And uh, for the Virgin Bus, uh, you were the stunt coordinator for, is that right, Rich? No, I worked with Branson. We did a, a live event with him. They were launching Virgin Airlines. Okay, so they wanted to give away, they wanted to do a big press deal um, in association with the Palms or whatever. So they hired me and my team. Again, I brought in the best riggers, descenders, you know, the whole deal. Cool. Um, rigged it up the day before. I tested it, went up and down it a bunch of times just for fun, you know, make sure everything's cool. And then he shows up and, you know, introduce, talk to him about what's going on. We ran him up and down a couple of times. Um, he had a good time. We understood what was going on, but the wind kind of, uh, there was an issue with wind and, you know, I, I discussed it with Richard. I said, well, just think about this. It, we want you to go nice and straight down the building. And originally while he was going down the side of the building, he was going to throw these round trip airline tickets that he had. So I, <laughs> I put the kibosh on that. I said, no, no, because here's the yeah. deal. The wind was like 20 miles an hour. And I explained to him, I said, I need you nice and straight. I need you to go straight down the building. When you get to the bottom, I'll be there to greet you, unhook you. You can walk out, say whatever you're going to say and throw the tickets. So I debriefed him up at the top right before the stunt. And I said, do, do not throw them while you're, while you're in, in free fall. The problem is, is if you know anything about diving or high falls or anything like that, when you dip a shoulder or turn an arm, that's that's creating rotation in your body. Okay, so uh, I explained to him with the wind, it's going to make your body rotate. It's going to push you back against the building. Okay, so I explained that in front of my crew. His PR people were all there taking pictures, doing their thing. I said, we're not doing it that way. Yeah. So I said, hey, Rich, gave him a little hug. I'll see you on the bottom, you know. So I took off, got in the elevator and went down. We... we have him go. He's coming down the building. He throws the tickets. <laughs> it rotates him into the building and he reached out. It cut his fingers 
and then it pushed him into the building so it ripped his pants oh my goodness and I look at my crew I'm on the thing going hey what's going on why did he throw the tickets and my crew guys told me that as soon as I left his PR people told him don't listen to him we want you to throw the tickets while you're falling wow Switcher, kind of switcheroo, change up session, huh? Uh, I, yeah, and, and, and that's, it's it's like, you're almost at the point where you're like, give me the tickets because I know what you're, <laughs> I know what you're going to do, but but you <laughs> think that, that a grown man would, would listen, and I'm sure when he got down, he's like, yeah, I, I probably shouldn't have done that, but yeah. Well, he I did mean, listen. He just listened to the wrong person. He, Instead of listening yeah. to the stunt coordinator, he listened to the PR gal who was like all of 25 years old yeah you know and so i felt so bad because i here i am in charge of this yeah. and what he did was out of my control he got to the bottom and after thing everything was over and done i walked up and kind of had a moment with him i said hey man that you know, that sucks i don't even believe that happened i wish you wouldn't have thrown those and he goes you know he said something like hey mate don't worry about it i have a good story to tell my kids you know or whatever he didn't like blame it on me or anything but you know, oh, it was Rich, just, I'm so glad that he wasn't hurt any more. He could have been hurt more, isn't that right? Um, I we would call it the cheese grater effect. Ooh. You know, like if you're gonna go flying down the side of a building and you know there's stucco on it and stuff like that. But I mean, it it just it freaked him out more than anything because when he threw the tickets, it rotated and he saw out of his peripheral um the building, so it freaked him out. He like I said, he stuck his hand out, which pushed him back this way. You know, it, it was one of those weird things that was completely out of my control. Yeah. yeah. I, like, I don't even know what I could have done to avoid it. Mm -hmm. I told him specifically how we're going to do it. And I walked away to get in the elevator to go down. And his people told him, don't listen to him, do it this way. So I, afterwards, I was just thinking, why the hell was I hired anyway? If they're not right. going to listen to you. <laughs> Yeah, they're not going to listen to you. I mean, they paid us $80,000 or something, but, you know, it's still, to me, is not worth somebody getting hurt. He right. didn't get hurt. He cut his little pinky and tore his pants. So, you know. What I, do you I think, think, Paul? Paul, over to you. He's, yeah. he, he, he's a big boy. And I'm sure if, if push came to shove, he would admit that. And and uh, he, he's, a, he's a thrill seeker. I mean, hey. you know. So yeah. If, you know. Uh, going up in he, space, he, you know, right? Going up I, in space. I think he was more. Yeah, I think he was more freaked out by it than like hurt or anything. You know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Sure. I don't. I don't even know how we got on the Branson kick. That's not even anything to do with the film film industry. Like we talked about the Spider Man and the Branson thing, and those are like live stunt things, which we do. You know. Sure. I, I, I've I've had a uh, I've had a stunt double uh, for. When I was on Bold and the Beautiful for a couple of nice. months, cool. Uh, they loved it because it was a it was like maybe one of the first times that they actually had stunt people and somebody rode a motorcycle. We kidnapped a Ron Moss, his character, and took him down to some Latin American country. And the brother and the father came down to rescue him. And uh, so there was a big fight scene. And and uh, you know for the close ups, it was it was it was Ron Moss and I and tussling. I grab his hair and. You know, uh, he, yeah, I grabbed his hair and we did all that. But then there was an actual fight scene. But you could actually tell, you know, they weren't really equipped, I think, to shoot it the right way. And you, you could definitely tell uh, when, when the stuntman kind of flashed across the camera, they're like, wait, that's supposed to be Paul. Like, it, it totally, you know, it wasn't yeah. me. You know, I think the guy even had like a goatee. I think I had longish hair, but you could just tell that it wasn't the same. They're like, no one cares. This is a soap opera. We, you know, we don't care about that. So it they was, gave it, was, it the old college try, right? They did. They, yeah, they did. And and the, the regulars, people that, the, you know, the regular fans, they don't care. Yeah. And, uh, but, but they were so excited to have excitement on the set, you know, because there's always lo it's just love stories and things. Yeah. But then when we were there for those couple right. of weeks for that, for that particular storyline, they, they, um, they, 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 they were very excited to have you know, a stunt people and fights and choreography and, and all that. So yeah, that, that was, that was a good, that was a good time. Awesome. Cool. 
And like um, thank you so much for sharing that, Paul, because that's so cool. You had a, a, a body double there. Uh, that's so, so fun. I love hearing stories like that. And um, I, I also wanted to ask, um, Rich, were you mentored by a certain stuntman or a group in the beginning of your career when you were first starting out? Well, I'm actually glad you asked that because it kind of transfers over to what's going on now. You know, when I started in the business, it was around 88 or so, um, I thought I was going to be an actor. And then I ended up, you know, floating around trying to get acting gigs. And anytime I would end up on a set as a totally green newbie, this is 34 years ago, I would gravitate towards the stunt people. Only because of my, my background, I grew up in North San Diego County, Del Mar, Encinitas area, surfing and rock climbing and jet skiing and, you know, skateboarding and doing all the, you know, action sports mecca is North San Diego County. And so I took a liking to stunts. And so there was a handful of people that kept me focused, gave me advice. And trust me, anybody like that was willing to give me the time of day, let alone some advice and, and have a conversation with me. I was like a sponge for knowledge. You know, I just wanted to learn everything about the business and the history of it and who came before me. And, you know, I think that most stunt people come from some kind of a background, whether they're military, martial arts, maybe they're equestrian or water sports. Uh, action sports is kind of how I segued my my way in. Um, it's really good to have a strong, solid background in in a handful of disciplines. But I always tell the young people, I go, you may be really, you may excel at one or two or three things, but you want to be well rounded. You know, just because doing repels are not your your favorite thing to do, you still should know how to do it. You're going to repel. What's a repel? Well, like repelling either off a cliff, like with a rope. Oh, um, propelling. Like re repelling. Rappelling. Rep repelling. Okay. Like yeah. Batman. Oh, no. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, not, not like Batman, but but yeah, yeah. Uh, repelling off of a, off of even from helicopters, right? Is is that a different type of repelling coming out of a helicopter, oh. or is that considered something else? there's different types of repels. There's fast rope, there's Australian style, there's standard, there's figure eights, there's greedy grease, there's, and there's so much, there's so much stuff to know. That's why it's, you know, as a stunt coordinator, I didn't wake up, first of all, I didn't wake up one day and even call myself a stunt man. Like I wanted to learn as much as I could about the business. And again, my world was action sports. It wasn't car crashes and getting lit on fire and, you know, things like that. I had to learn that stuff, but I had a good athletic background. Um, calling myself a stunt coordinator, that's a whole nother ball game because back in my early day, that was the kiss of death. If you were green and new and, you know, didn't even know anything about the business, it was sketchy to even call yourself a professional stuntman because you weren't. Forget about calling yourself a stunt coordinator. I mean, that's a kiss of death because the real deal stunt coordinators, the big time guys, they laugh at that. You know, there's guys running around here in Vegas, you know, claiming to be stunt coordinators. They don't know anything about, again, car prep or, or repels or fire burns or anything like that. And it scares me. I've seen some really scary videos lately. Um, people doing falls and they're coming in hot like this and they're they're actually landing on their shoulders, neck and back, and folding in half. We call that a lawn chair because you're folding up like a lawn chair. And I've seen people getting getting lit on fire by people and, and their safety team are people that don't know about fire science. It's really dangerous. And it's, it's kind of, it's bothersome to me. How important is safety with stunt coordinating and uh, and doing stunts? It's vitally important, right, Rich? Well, I mean, there's there's no room for error. If I don't, if I get complacent or don't know what I'm doing, like, okay, you guys interview people all the time, whether directors, actors, producers, whatever. You can fake it till you make it. 
you can wake up and call yourself a producer and put on a hat that says director or whatever. You can kind of wing it. In stunts, uh uh-uh, negative. Because you're going to get hurt or killed or you're going to hurt or kill somebody else. Wow. So I take it very serious. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been, you know, I've been outspoken about my craft because there's a right way and a wrong way to do things. And in some cases, I think that some of the locals that have got into it over the last few years have been getting training and advice from people that aren't actually stunt people. And I think, like, I get calls all the time, people sending me their resumes, they, you know, and I always respond back to everybody, even if they don't even have a chance of being a stunt person. And first thing I tell them, is, I said, learn your craft, be respectful of people with experience, if you want advice, why not get it from somebody that actually knows what they're talking about? And the biggest thing is, is people kind of fudging on their resumes. You know, that's kind of the kiss of, kiss of death because it's pretty easy for somebody like me to decipher somebody's resume or IMDB or whatever because you pretty much know the, the skill level of somebody. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because uh, oh. over time, yeah, over time, it comes out the truth, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm just worried, that, you know, we're going to have an Alec Baldwin incident here in Vegas. I don't know what scale it's going to be on, but I'm telling you, it's it's concerning. And the other thing, too, that is like the producers need to understand is that there's a lot of, and this has been going on for years, people will will and do and have bought roles, okay? They've, they've paid to have a role in some of these productions. Okay, whatever, that's been going on for years as actors, but what I've been hearing over the last year or two here in Vegas is people are paying to do stunts on films and or doing the old, oh, we'll give you, we'll feed you and give you an IMDb credit. So I'm thinking like, you got to ask yourself, if you get hurt on that production, you know, is it worth it? You made 50 bucks and got a piece of pizza and now you've got a broken arm. Yeah, but wow. even worse than that is, People don't understand these people that are doing GoFundMe and, and, and things like that. If I give you 50 bucks for a film or $50,000 for your film and somebody hires a stunt coordinator that is not legit and doesn't know what they do, they're doing and they hurt or kill somebody, a lawyer is going to get on IMDb and look up the 50 producers that put in 50 bucks or 50 grand or whatever, it doesn't matter if you put in 50 bucks, you're going to be named in the lawsuit. Wow. Okay, so like stunts are nothing to mess with. And again, I, I think that some of the local production teams, they don't, I've offered up, look, even if you can't afford to hire me, at least call me and bounce some ideas off me. I'd rather try to give somebody positive feedback on what to do and what not to do versus get somebody hurt but people think like they'll look at my resume or whatever or or experience level and they will they'll go we won't even call him because we can't afford it you know Mm -hmm. and when people actually meet me they're like oh well he's cool he talked to me and told me what to do and what not to do yeah so I I I want to say to everybody out there in Las Vegas um, that they can contact a true professional, Rich Hopkins, and he will be number one with safety uh, because that's what's so important now. And and it is serious business. Isn't that right, Paul? Yeah, 100%. And so th- thank you for protecting uh, the, the industry here in Vegas. But these, you're right. You know, uh, we have this almost Wild West mentality where like, we'll just get it done. And I mean, it's, it's, I think it's okay in the spirit of maybe business or, you know, go out there and doing it, fake it till you make it, but not when it comes to somebody's safety, your own or, or, or putting somebody else at risk. So uh, I, I, so thank you for, for making that offer. And, and I hope that people do at least take you, take you up on it. I mean, you're, you know, and your time is valuable and I hope that they realize that, but you're willing to put that aside in order to make sure that people's productions are safe and, uh, or like you said, you don't have to do stuff. Don't do stunts. Don't write something that it requires all these stunts. If you don't have the budget for it, save that for your next project. Save that for when you do have 
a budget to hire a proper stunt coordinator and a proper team. And, and they'll actually listen to you because it, it sounds like you get hired and then, no, we still want to do it our way. Then why even hire you? And, and I know that you, that you've stepped away from a project that, that I was involved in actually, which I didn't, I didn't realize is that I'm a small part in this film, but you, you actually, uh, and I don't know if you want to touch on that or not, but you actually stepped away from it uh, be, or well, uh, because they, they weren't going to listen to you type of a thing, or, or maybe well, they didn't want you there because of that. I mean, I can give you the, the reader's digest version. It, it was a film called the trust. It was Nicholas Cage, Elijah Woods. I was hired by my friends, Jason Miller and Chris Ramirez, it, but they also teamed up with a, a group out of New York. Um, Everything was great. Did two weeks of prep on it. We had everything ready to go. I had about 10 stunt performers all ready to go. And then the day before our big stunt meeting, I was called in and, and told we're going to, for we had a big chase shootout scene with a SWAT van and a mm -hmm. bad mm -hmm. guys and swerving and weaving in and out of traffic and all that. And I was asked to hire background drivers to do that. And I said, I don't think that's a really good idea unless they're like really far down, you know, you know, not in the general vicinity of, of the action. And I explained to him that I've got a driving team of about 20 people that are current, former race car drivers, IndyCar, NASCAR, off-road racing, drifting, whatever, that are up and coming and that will work for the 384 rate. Um, for, and, he, and for some reason, they wanted to pay 184 to background guys, and nothing wrong with that. I, I love all background people are important to a production, you know, in their own way. I don't think behind the wheels a good thing because I've had situations where we've had background guys put into the mix. They get a little overzealous. They want to like show us what they can do. Next thing you know, you know, you're trading paint with some guy that's supposed to be two car lengths behind you. So I don't like it. And I was at, I told him, I said, I didn't think that was a good idea. And he goes, well, we'll talk about it in, in tomorrow's meeting. This is a, one of the guys out of New York. Next morning, I get a call from my friend who was one of the production managers saying, don't bother coming into the stunt meeting. Glenn doesn't want you <laughs> on board because you won't compromise. And I'm like, well, I don't compromise safety. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sucked. I mean, it would have been a cool gig. You know, you're thinking, hey, Nicholas Cage, Elijah Wood, everything's cool. Next thing you know, you're at home. So, right. Uh, yeah, it's so they didn't important. Even end up doing that scene, they cut that scene out. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, you know what? I just want to thank you again for have, holding safety in the highest standards possible, because that's what it's all about. And as you mentioned before, Rich, um, our lives are so precious and they're in the hands of the stunt coordinators, stuntmen and producers there and directors. So with that being mindful, we want to thank you so much for always looking out and for caring for people uh, so very much. You're absolutely amazing, Rich. And um, we have to start wrapping up the show. I'm so sorry it's gone so fast, but we're going to do final final thoughts here. And I'm going to go over to you, Rich, first for final thoughts. Over to you. Well, my final thoughts are, you know, I care about people. I love working with creative people and, and creating great action for productions. Again, you know, we've obviously touched on it. Safety is my number one concern. Um, I think that the young up and coming people that want to be in the stunt profession should, you know, learn the craft, learn from experienced people, stay focused, stay humble. You know, we don't, who cares about the red carpet and the star meter and all that? Because like, you know, the star meter thing, to me, that's a joke. And I've heard maybe it helps actors if you got a little high star meet or whatever. That doesn't mean anything to me in stunts. I want to see your demo reel. I'm going to call your references. Hey, have you worked with so-and-so? You know, I'm not going to compromise my 34-year career. And I think I joked with you earlier about it. I'm too old to go. I don't want to be a greeter at Walmart. I like the profession I'm in. And I'd like to continue on with it till they put me in a box or something. So, yeah. Well, at, at least if, if you do become a greeter at Walmart, you'll be the hottest guy there. So, <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the truth right there? 
<laughs> well, um, that's wonderful. So thank you for that. And Paul, over to you, final thoughts? That was my final thought. Uh, no. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay. I, 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 I love it because I've, I, of course, I've, and I think every young boy, every boy, every man that becomes very interested, mine goes way back to maybe even see, watching the stuntman, the, the, that famous movie, The Stuntman. Mm -hmm. and, and then, of course, The Fall Guy on television. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so the, the industry is always so romanticized and, and, and it's Hollywood, you know, you're still part of Hollywood. But uh, it's great to, to actually meet you face to face. And I've, I think I've realized yeah. I've had just such a, su such a basic understanding of it that it's great to actually get to talk to you and, and meet someone that's in the industry and it's a professional in the industry and then someone that cares as much as, as I think most people you know do care, but then you get your few bad apples. So thank you for, for sharing your story with us. Um, and it kind of just goes to show that we're, we're all one, one family and it takes all these pieces of the puzzle to make a, a, prod, a product, make a project work. You know, yeah. so it, and it's not easy. So thank you for, for being a part of that. And thank you for sharing your story. And maybe we inspire or motivate someone to get into the industry, but to do it right and not just do it for the TikTok or do it for the Instagram. You know, it's it's like yeah. you know, you're doing it and you're doing it safely. So you're you know. doing it safely. That's so important. Thank you so much, Paul. And I do want to ask everybody to follow Rich Hopkins and Thrill Seekers Unlimited. If you're interested in having the best stuntman and stunt coordinator uh, and stunt advice on your um, on your movie or short film or documentary. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Please follow him on Instagram, Facebook. Look him up. Check him out. He's also on IMDb. Isn't that right? Anywhere else they can contact you, Rich? It's, I mean, if you just Google Rich Hopkins stunts, I think kind of every website I'm in, on is there. And there's yes. photos and tons well, of photos and video on the website. We just redid it. And there's downloadable PDFs of our client list and, and all of that stuff. But Producers, don't be scared to call, you know, I mean, I, I'm happy to help out smaller budget projects. You know, it's better than staying home and watching Jerry Springer, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And you're a great professional to work with, Rich. So we want to thank you so much. We're so thankful and grateful to you. And you're such a great guy. And I have to say, until we meet again next time, <laughs> stay safe and have fun. Thank you again, Rich. Thank you very much for having me. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Too.